With this talk, working effectively with storyboards, I'm hoping to convince some of you guys who aren't using storyboards in your apps right now that you can use storyboards and <coughs> you can also scale using storyboards into, into bigger apps and with bigger teams. And for you guys who are already using storyboards today, I'm also hoping that you learn something new by getting some tips and tricks on how you can use storyboards even more effectively. So uh, first let's start with a quick show of hands. Uh, in your apps that you're mainly working on today, uh, how many of you are using storyboards? All right, so that's around like 60-70%, something like that. So at the end of this talk, I hope that I've convinced the rest of you. Uh, so first, a full disclosure, I absolutely love visual editors. Uh, the core data model editor, superb. Uh, when I started doing GUI programming, uh, this was back in the university and we started doing Java. And uh, Swing was the first uh, UI framework that I was using. And there I had to do all, all the UI in code and I just felt it was such a long feedback loop for me to, to fix stuff. And from there, in another project later on, we moved on to using GTK, which is a UI framework for uh, Linux. And with GTK, there was this uh, program called Glade. Uh, and Glade was kind of like an interface builder, but for Linux. And it really, uh, it really opened my mind about uh, that this was the way to, to do GUI programming uh, for real. So when I started doing iOS programming and this was just as Xcode 4 was coming out and you could have your code and your UI side by side and even interact in between them by dragging and dropping outlets, outlets and actions, I was instantly hooked. Okay, so why should you really be using storyboards then? So the first thing I already mentioned, it really shortens your feedback loop, right? And uh, I guess you've all heard about IB designables, uh, which was a new feature in, in Xcode 7, I believe, last year. Uh, so with designables, you can have your code, you can still program your custom views, and then you can instantly see how they render live. Uh, but another really, really useful tool uh, with, that you get with Storyboards and Interface Builder is the Preview Assistant. And the Preview Assistant uh, is somewhat underused, I believe, but uh, it's really great for a few couple of things. So the first thing which, is, which it is really great for is uh, to lay out for different devices. So with iOS 9, Apple still didn't kill the iPhone 4S. So every time uh, we're designing UI and we have to take account for the iPhone 4S, we still need to squeeze all the UI together, but we don't want to make it look squeezed when it's on a bigger device, right? And the preview assistant uh, in Interface Builder really helps with that. Uh, so you could inspect uh, uh, one of your view controller scenes and then add all your different uh, devices that you want to check the layout for and it will render the layout for those devices so you can instantly see if you need to tweak some uh, some parameters in your auto layout constraints maybe change some compression resistance or priorities between different constraints it's, and you don't have to run uh, your app on the different devices themselves uh, another thing, which is really cool, is that if you're uh, having a localization in your app and you need to support different languages, you could uh, implement uh, base internationalization, which is really cool. So with that, you get separate string files for all your different storyboards and, uh, and nib files. And you can use a tool which, is, uh, which comes with the Xcode command line utilities called ibtool. And you can use some scripts with that to make sure that all your string files are updated when you add new stuff to your interfaces. 
and then when you edit those string files instead of setting the you know the NS localized strings in code runtime if you do it directly in the string files you actually get a preview of the localization right in interface builder which is really really nice because then when you're tweaking layout you can see you can watch if uh, if some of your languages uh, break or not and I'm gonna there's gonna be a link in the end of the slides uh, with uh, with the script for using Ibitool. Now in my opinion the biggest benefit really for using storyboards is that it it can become somewhat of a documentation for your entire app so you can think of your storyboards as wireframes so whenever a new developer jumps into your project uh, they can just have your app side by side and look at the storyboards and when they want to dwell deeper into a view controller they can see where it is and they can find that view controller class and uh, look up how for instance a uh, collection view controller loads its data and so forth if you're not using storyboards but c c do your interfaces in loose nibs or in code uh, it c can become quite hard for a new developer to get into the project setup and uh, because then you have to browse a lot of files to to get to know how the application fits together and you could of course always start with the app delegate but as we all know it, that can be come quite bloated and you don't really get an overview of how your uh, app flows uh, so another thing is the lesser code the better so by not writing code but letting interface builder write code for you your code becomes a lot less clutter and becomes much more readable and uh, i also think that you can be spared of a lot of bugs by by letting the the system tools do the coding for you whenever possible now uh, another uh, underappreciated uh, benefit you get from using storyboards is that whenever Apple uh, introduces new platform or framework features um, a lot of times they assume you are using storyboards and make it easier for you as the developer if you are using storyboards so if you look at some of the some of the previous new UI technologies we got in previous iOS versions like size classes and uh, and auto layout and presentation controllers those were all pretty hard to work with in code but became very easy when using storyboards and for instance uh, the presentation controllers when they first arrived in iOS 8 when you if you wanted to implement them in your code base you had to do a lot of boilerplate stuff with setting up delegates but now in iOS 9 when you have custom segways uh, the segways uh, themselves become a really natural place for for holding that code and a more recent example is uh, 3d touch so 3d touch uh, came around a few months ago with the iphone 6s release and one of the really standard ways of uh, implementing 3D Touch was the peek and pop gesture where you hold down a link and you can use it in Safari you get a preview of, of the view controller behind it and then you could press it a bit more to navigate there so if you're using code uh, you would have to implement a few delegates in your view controllers and add a bunch of code uh, but with storyboards and segways this was as simple as just filling in a checkbox and you were completely done so the biggest question that uh, people usually bring up with storyboards and the biggest uh, the biggest problems people have with storyboards is due to scaling so the two most common problems with scaling is uh, having storyboards become huge uh, and also getting merge conflicts so i'm going to show you how you can address that so the first thing uh, which everybody should do when using storyboards is to break your app up into several distinct storyboards so for instance if you have 
uh, if you're using a tab bar controller in your app, uh, you would let uh, each of your different tabs become a separate storyboard, and then you have a storyboard for your tab controller itself, linking to the other scenes, and then maybe a storyboard for your onboarding when the user logs in or registers your service. And uh, that way it's, it's really to easy to navigate around the app. And uh, I think a good rule of thumb is to never have more than around 10 scenes in a single storyboard and try to break it up as much as you can. Well, not really. So the thing you're talking about, uh, the storyboard references, they were introduced uh, with Xcode 7 and they work with iOS 8 and 9. Um, but you could, uh, even before, you could have multiple storyboards, but uh, you had to figure out how to navigate between view controllers in one storyboard to the next uh, using code. So before, you would, if you had implemented URL routing in your app, for instance, you could use the same kind of logic to navigate between your storyboards in the code. But now, just as you, as you mentioned, uh, in iOS 8 and 9, we have the new reference uh, segues, which makes this even, even more... Um, uh, it, it brings it up to the surface, because you don't have any... You don't need to have any uh, jumps in code, but instead it's visible right in the storyboard. So that's really great. So the second thing, storyboard conflicts. So how many are receiving storyboard merge conflicts on a semi-regular basis? Quite a few shown of hands. So th the problem with storyboards and, uh, and uh, version control systems is that they, they suffer from the same problem as Xcode project files, and that's stupid diff engines who think that if you add something, if you add two different things on the same line or uh, create new lines uh, in the text file, then it becomes a conflict. So in project files, you get these merge conflicts so whenever two different people add two different files to the project. And there are, there are different ways to remedy that. And, uh, and for storyboards, the way you, ca you can remedy this is by pre-allocating empty scenes and segues. So if you know that your team is going to be working on a new feature that involves a new user flow uh, and a lot of new scenes, what you can do is to set up a storyboard and just put in empty scenes all over the place for, for the different scenes you know that you're going to build and just lay out a few couple of, uh, of segues in between them uh, the way the user flow will be, but without going into the details. And then each developer can just work in their single scene, and they can work in different branches, and they won't get any merge conflicts. And uh, th th we have been testing this uh, in, in, a, in a previous project I was working on, where we were six developers in a single storyboard. And we hardly got any merge conflicts, because we did it in this fashion. So to answer the bigger question, yes, it scales. So, uh, and as a, an example, uh, I can use that project that I was mentioning. So in that app, it, this was a universal app with over 100 view controllers. And we had 21 storyboards. And, and you know, some of these different features and user flows were triggered by, by feature flags and weren't shown to all users. And we could handle that scale with storyboards. Uh, of course, maybe if you're Facebook or Google or Spotify, where you have uh, even more developers, it can become hard. But uh, in a six developer team, we didn't have any storyboard related issues using these uh, tips and tricks. So, uh, some general tips. Um, if you're using designables, uh, what you should do is to put them inside their own framework and not let them be part of the app target. Uh, because that dramatically increases the feedback loop when you change in your designable code, especially if you, 
uh, if you're uh, working on uh, coding the view from scratch, it goes much more rapid and it also shortens the time to load a storyboard because then Interface Builder uh, doesn't need to recompile your entire app just to render a few simple views. Uh, then there's a really great tool called SwiftGen. Uh, so whenever you actually need to use code to, to route uh, users in your app, for instance if you do any URL handling, uh, then you want to make sure that you don't break something by, by for instance, changing a, a Segway reference ID uh, and then your code breaks. So SwiftGen uh, generates enums, uh, strongly typed Swift enums for uh, all, your, uh, all your storyboards, all your storyboard scenes and all the segues and that way you don't get any, any stringly types in your code. Uh, another quite hidden feature in Xcode 7 is that you can you can have loose views in the scene doc so I'm going to show it to you in just a short while the scene doc is the is the place where you have the icons for your view controller and your file owner and if you add gesture recognizers they will pop up in this tiny bar and now you can add uh, views that you don't uh, use audio layout for maybe that reacts to to tapping something and then you want to place a view there and then you can use this dock to have these views part of your scene but without having to be inside the view controller at start. And the last thing I want to mention uh, which I'm gonna have a demo on is that you can actually if you're using loose nibs you can wrap them and make them designable in a storyboard which is pretty awesome and you can do some really awesome stuff with that. So time with a demo. Let's see if the demo gods are with me. Okay so let's imagine this this storyboard being uh, uh, inside a game and this is some kind of result screen where you play the game and you can either try again or or be done and uh, go back to the menu. Uh, now when you come to the screen we want to uh, either show this little view or, or this one. And uh, the way we could have done this is just placing both views directly in the scene but that would clutter the scene a lot and it would be hard to you'd have to uh, toggle them back and forth in order to edit them um, or you could instantiate them using code but then you can't preview them anymore and then you, you can't see how they're gonna be laid out uh, live right uh, so what you instead can do is to wrap them in a designable so I made this little class called a nib wrapper view. Wow, that's this uh, font was huge. Um, this is somewhat better, right? Uh, so this is really simple and I have a white cursor so I don't see anything. So uh, this view just has a, a nib name property uh, and whatever you set the nib name property to it's gonna load that nib and add that nib as a subview. And what's, what's also neat is that it overrides intrinsic content view. So it basically fools the auto layout system uh, that the wrapped view uh, has the content size of the, of the full view that is being wrapped. So with using this, we can make our view inside here a nib wrapper view and then we have to set its nib name so we can set it to what was it windscreen now somebody's calling me it's mom <laughs> uh, and you can see the, the the nib is rendering which is really cool and we can even go to the preview pane and if the demo gods are with me it should render here ah but it doesn't okay 
<laughs> of course. Uh, but what's even cooler is that if I make uh, another class which uh, just wraps the, the nib wrapper view, which is really simple, called a win-lose view. I'm uh, so good with names. Uh, and you can, as you can see, this class just has a single property, winning. It's a bool. Either you win or you lose. And by using that, uh, it sets the corresponding uh, nib name for the view to load. So, if we instead change this class to a win-lose view, then we can say, set the winning to on or off, and we instantly render uh, the different uh, nibs. And this can be really useful, for instance, if you're building, I used it to build login UIs, where you have different ways of logging in, but you still want to be in the same onboarding flow. So you can have an email login or a bank ID login, and then you can just use the UI view tra transition from view to view methods to make transitions when the, when the user changes the login methods. Uh, yeah, now it, yeah, now you can see how it renders. Uh, and what's also even cooler is that now if you go to the, if you open this nib in a, in a separate uh, assistant editor here, and we switch this to loose view, you can really easy start editing this view, and you're gonna see how the preview updates. So if we change this emoji into a frowning emoji, so currently you have to go to editor and refresh all views for this to take place. And then you see how the view is going to be laid out on all your different devices, uh, even though you're using a separate NIMP file. So uh, I think, oh yeah, the, the view doc thing. So for instance, if we, if we would want to have a loading indicator, we don't want to lay it out here directly, but we can put it up here. And then we can, you can see that we get a separate tiny little window for it. Uh, and we can edit it just as uh, the, the regular views inside the scene and attach it with an IB outlet. And that was basically it for my talk. So uh, here are some links. Uh, there's the string extraction script I was talking about for, for doing the localization, the nib wrapper view, uh, which you just saw, and uh, a link to SwiftJump. So, yeah, thank you very much.